<laughs> Thank you. The treat is all mine. I, I'm really grateful to have this, um, to have had the repeated pleasure of doing this. So thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. Um, today I want to peer into the universe and see if we can find some truth. Um, I always like to set high bars for our classes here, I figure. If anybody can do it, you can. So, um, the, From the perspective that I'll talk about today, the romantics and the beats we're both looking for ways of, in a sense, opening up passages in the universe in order to peer in to find absolute truth. So this is a familiar quest, I suppose, a kind of spiritual quest or perhaps a religious quest. In this case, it's a poetic quest and one that we are familiar with from uh, Wordsworth and from Shelley and a lot of the things that we've talked about. So I, I want to begin with um, Blake briefly, and then go to Ginsburg, and hopefully in so doing I can convince you that there is a, a relationship between the Romantics and, and the Beats, um, but also that there is a quest in both of them that, is, that will be for you, I think, familiar, and I think that all of us will connect to. Um, it begins with a sunflower, which is a very short and very famous poem that becomes, in some ways, the emblematic work for Allen Ginsberg. It becomes really his entranceway into this quest for absolute truth. So I want to begin here, and then we're going to take a look at what Ginsberg had to say about this work, and what he said about the entire process of searching for truth in the way that he does. And in, in, in reading him, you'll see that there's a very powerful intellectual side to his thinking, and he's also a clown. And I love that combination myself, um, and I, I think that we need to consider clowns today. Clowns are people who are enabled, in fact, they're authorized to tell the truth, and they're authorized to act out and they're authorized to um, be buffoons or be silly. And it's often the clowns who know the truth, as you know. So you watch the news during the day, and you're lied to all day long. And then you watch the comedians at night make fun of the news, and then you realize that you can now go to sleep and feel better. And that, and, and I like the daylight n night uh, contrast as well. You know, during the day we pretend that we're serious and we pretend that we know the answers to questions that we actually don't understand at all and we pretend to believe our politicians and we pretend to believe uh, people who are trying to sell us things. And then at night after a few drinks we put on our clown outfits and we realize that um, everything that has happened during the day has been a farce and now we can settle back and laugh. And I, I think that that's a crucial part of, of, of what we're going to be talking about today. So Ginsberg is a philosopher, uh, and a very profound philosopher, but he also acts out. And for those of you who have ever either met him, and I know that uh, many, many people have met him, he was a very public uh, figure, um, or if you've heard of him, you know that he was always clowning around. And he very purposefully tries to bring knowledge down to earth so that we can access it. Or at least that's the effect of the way that he works. So there's going to be a little bit of naughtiness in, in what he says, uh, as you know. And there's uh, swearing and so forth. But I'd, I'd like to consider all that swearing and naughtiness philosophically. Uh, swearing is a way to bring things down to earth. If we say, that guy doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about, you immediately, you feel that's a, that's a surprising thing to hear. And it makes you laugh, or it makes you smile inside, or it makes you feel maybe uneasy, particularly if it's a person of authority. Swearing 
has that effect in language of bringing highfalutin ideas down to earth. And just the way that it, it's even said, the guy doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. He doesn't have a fucking clue what he's talking about. If you add, the, if you add that, it, it adds another level of poignancy to it. And it, makes, it disturbs you but, and makes you uneasy, perhaps. And often that uneasiness comes out in laughter. Because laughter is, in, in a sense, a kind of betwixt and between feeling. It's somewhere between horror and revelation. So laughter is a very important part of what we're going to be talking about today. And I think that Ginsburg uses laughter, and he uses his clown-like presence to enlighten us. And, and I, I think that's, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very important. It's why perhaps we think that comedians are in, the, in possession of, of, of truth in ways that politicians uh, and those who claim to have the truth are not, uh, even though we might pretend that they do or might want to pretend that they do. It, we, it makes us feel better when we go to sleep at night if we think that maybe they have a clue what they're talking about. But in actuality, we know that they generally don't. So, <laughs> all that being as it is, um, we shall begin with, with an extremely strange uh, character, uh, Blake. Um, and I, I'll mention, because it, it keeps disappearing, I'll mention that there's a collection of Blake materials in the library that was given um, in my name uh, by the Brussel family. Uh, there's a guy named uh, Carl Brussel. His father published Tropic of Cancer and went to jail for it. Uh, uh, he's one of the few American publishers who actually went to jail on censorship laws. A uh, very important uh, publisher, very interesting person. And I helped his son out completely by accident in a story way too long to tell, uh, getting him into Canada. And as a consequence, he gave a, a bunch of gifts to Vanderbilt. Um, one of the gifts that he gave is in front of the biomedical library. It is uh, a work by Jack Tarr called The Gates of Hell. Um, and it honors uh, the fall in, uh, in, in Vietnam. Um, but it's a really remarkable sculpture and, and uh, an incredible uh, piece of work. So if you're walking over there, that was given by the Brussels family. But there's also a collection of Blake works that were given uh, to the library in the, what is called the Brussels collection. And there you can see these magnificent colored uh, pages. And it's one of the great pleasures of uh, reading Blake is to look at the relationship between the pictures and the words. Um, and it's an important part of what we're talking about here today. So, but, but let's begin with, with Ah, Sunflower. Very short, powerful work. Ah, sunflower, weary of time, who countest the steps of the sun, seeking after that sweet golden climb where the traveler's journey is done, where the youth pined away with desire and the pale virgin shrouded in snow arise from their graves and aspire where my sunflower wishes to go. This is a poem that has been subjected to many, many interpretations. I think for the purposes of today's discussion, it's appropriate to focus on a few issues. One of them, of course, is that the sunflower is following the sun, and the sun indicates or beckons or calls or is a sign of some kind of truth. So you could imagine the sunflower, as it uh, follows the sun during the day, as being in pursuit of this truth, this eternal truth. Maybe it's in pursuit of uh, some kind of a heavenly uh, truth. Maybe it's in, in search of some kind of enlightenment, the sun, of course, representing that. And there are two figures who are described, um, this pale youth and the virgin, both of whom perhaps wish to pursue this same quest. So we have both of them aspiring, as it were, aspiring upwards uh, to this truth, where my sunflower wishes to go. So the, I, I think what, what, what Ginsburg found particularly powerful in this work was this idea that somewhere out there, accessible perhaps by some complex means, is the, 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 the truth that the sun here presumably represents. And there's a story, and I have to apologize, this is an 18 and over crowd, I hope. Um, but Ginsburg 
in, in searching for the truth, did a, a very romantic poetry thing, which is to try to render the world strange. Estranjene, right? To render the world strange. And he did so not by standing on cliffs or looking up at Mont Blanc, as Shelley did, or by harvesting his own mind and his memories, as we've talked about as regards Wordsworth, or by harnessing himself to the bird, as we saw in Ode to a Nightingale and Keats. But rather, he, living in a city as congested and noisy and so forth as New York, has to find a place where he can tear open the universe. And of course, doesn't have any access to nature, uh, as you can imagine. So he defers to uh, sex, to drugs, to poetry. It, 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 he's trying to do, I would argue, the same thing as Shelley and Wordsworth are trying to do. And the story that is told is that he also thinks that he needs to, as it were, multitask. So he is um, pleasuring himself in his apartment and reading A Sunflower at the same time. I'm just, I'm just telling the truth. <laughs> None of this is my fault, and you know, I, I, I'm not like, you know, it's, it is what it is. And in so doing, um, there are many different methods, I guess. But in so doing, uh, he he peered into some kind of, of horizon of eternity, and this was a, a revelatory moment. It only happened one more time in his life in the Columbia University bookstore. Um, when he was all again multitasking, not doing the f uh, the second thing, um, and he uh, saw the figures around him as kind of monsters. He he saw the world differently, um, and I I'm sure that this has happened to you. I was skiing once, and I had this really amazing revelation that was that was so powerful. It still puts uh, I, I I still get chills when I think about it. I saw the tree. We are right near the the the, tr the end of the, the you know the tree line. So above it was the glaciers, and then there were the trees. And I all of a sudden was able to penetrate into the ground and realize that trees, are, in fact, are underground. And that all you're seeing is like a little shoot out of it. It's like as you know, though you took broccoli and you buried it except for just the very top of it. And most of it is under the ground. For some reason, when I was skiing that day, I was able to see the root system. And it, it, it's as though you can you know, penetrate into, into the truth of things. And that is very close to what I think um, Ginsburg is trying to do. And after having had this, this revelation, this, this image of eternity, he sought to reproduce that sensation repeatedly through his life. And he did so through, through meditation. He did through, so through poetry. He did so through yoga. He did so through uh, all sorts of different uh, means and would write about it. So we begin here with uh, our sunflower. And then we go to an interview. Now, this is, this is a combination of the clown and the headiness. This is an interview in the Paris Review, which, as you know, is a magnificent uh, 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 journal, uh, literary journal. And one of the things that characterizes the Paris Review is that they have been doing interviews with authors for decades and decades. And you can look them up. If, 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 um, any number of your favorite authors will have been interviewed by the Paris Review. And all of the beats were. And the interviews are absolutely fascinating. So you, you just type it in online, or you can subscribe to the Paris Review, which gives you the um, access to the whole archive. So in this interview, Ginsburg is talking about Cezanne. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, have seen Cezanne. If you've been to Aix-en-Provence, uh, where Cezanne was born, uh, you know that he was friends. He was best friends with Zola, uh, which connects multiple courses that we've done together here at Osher. Um, Cezanne had as one of the characteristics in his painting the idea not of using lines, as we say, for example, in Degas, but rather the juxtaposition of color. So the, the, the image emerges not from linear, you know, the, the creation of pictures with lines, but rather through the, the, the kind of shocking juxtaposition of colors uh, together. And this is something that uh, Ginsburg learned from Meyer Shapiro. So he, this is heady stuff. Meyer Shapiro was one of the great New York intellectuals, part of the partisan review crowd, uh, who talked a lot about abstract expressionism and so forth. 
And it reminds us that Ginsburg was part of a, a profound intellectual elite uh, it's in some ways. He attended Columbia University. He got kicked out of Columbia University twice. Um, and again, that's the clown-like thing, right? He, he was arrested. He scrawled things on his windows. He, he um, uh, transported drugs over state lines. He uh, kept uh, stolen goods in his apartment. He knew about a murder that was committed, committed in a park by a friend of his. You know, it is what it is. Um, and and he, he nonetheless, you know, repeatedly returned there. And one does not get the impression that he learned an enormous amount at Columbia University, uh, uh, nonetheless. He did study with Lionel Trilling, with whom he had a long-standing uh, correspondence. Lionel and Diana Trilling, uh, although Diana was not crazy about him because of, uh, he, he made his husband act, she made, he, uh, Ginsburg made uh, Lionel Trilling act out, apparently, uh, which makes sense. So the, the, the point is that if you study Ginsburg and you needed to understand all of his references, it would demand that you get to know an enormous pantheon of great American intellectuals, great European intellectuals, great Indian intellectuals, great South American intellectuals, because he was in the kind of center of a nexus of, of people, one of them being uh, Meyer Shapiro. So he says, in, um, I got all hung up on Cezanne, Around 1949, my last year at Columbia, studying with Meyer Shapiro. I don't know how it led into it. I think it was about the same time I was having these Blake visions. Okay, so these are the ones that I was making reference to. So, the thing I understand from Blake was that it was possible to transmit a message through time that could reach the enlightened, that poetry had a definite effect. It wasn't just pretty or just beautiful, as I had understand pretty beauty before. It was something basic to human existence, where it reached something, it reached the bottom of human existence. Now this should, I think, resonate a little bit with what we read both in Wordsworth and in particular in Shelley, that the beautiful was not really um, desirable. Beauty, as we've described it, is, it, it's beautiful, it's, it's, but it lacks the truth. Beauty and truth may not be uh, self-identical. Self maybe there's more truth in the sublime, or maybe there's more truth in direct engagement. But anyway, he's, he's thinking about beauty. The impression I got was kind of a time machine through which he could transmit, Blake could transmit his basic consciousness and communicate it to someone else after he was dead. In other words, build a time machine. And I love this idea of texts as time machines, and it's a, it's a crucial issue. You'll see it later on also uh, in Burroughs. William Burroughs T uh, juxtaposes two uh, texts together. Um, I, I don't have a text, all I have is a magazine, but we, we can do it. So it, you can take two uh, texts and juxtapose them and create a new text. So let's say I, I there's an art there, see if we can find something that sounds exciting. Okay, so we've got here an article about. I don't know what, and another article about I don't know what. Let's see if we can put them together and learn something. Um, so let's see, I'll do this. This is complicated. And we always have to do these things on the fly because otherwise they're no fun. <laughs> All right, so here we've got, uh, so one of the articles is about ISIS, and the other one is about a uh, play on Broadway. It has been an unbelievable expectation for something George W. Bush said about the very first time that still is showbiz. <laughs> there is an American Shakespeare. They are dying in the middle. Who did the same weren't even born yet, while producers cleared the Iraqi musical Un de Kuwait. <laughs> and I spent roughly half such a sterling cast way around the world near Shrek on Broadway. <laughs> All right. So that, you know, completely random. In this case, it's maybe less of a time machine than it is a space machine, but we've learned stuff. It's quite fascinating that you never knew about Broadway. 
and about ISIS, and about whoever knows what else. And what's interesting about that particular time machine that Burroughs is describing is that it's not possible to do it cognitively. One of the things that Chomsky teaches us is that we can't help but create proper syntax. Uh, as a teacher, I sometimes try to imitate a really badly written paper. Um, and it's, for some reason, my brain won't allow me to do it. You actually have to memorize it. Because poor syntax or poor arrangement is just some, not something that comes naturally to us. So you need to disturb the normal patterns of language in order to create completely new meaning. So cut-ups, which is what I'm describing here, is one way of doing it. And cut-ups both serve that purpose, but also can serve as time machines. You can take you know, a Shakespeare text and a letter that uh, you wrote yesterday and cut the two together and see what you come up with. Right? So, so anyway, there, Ginsburg, who knew Burroughs, who slept with Burroughs, uh, uh, and they were both at Columbia, they were interested in these types of issues. How do you use language as a kind of portal into truth? Um, so here Ginsburg is describing the poem itself as a time machine. Burroughs was much more interested in disturbing uh, the time machine and creating uh, new meaning. So, um, so we're thinking about poetry in this way. And we're thinking about Blake as a portal into some kind of truth. Now, just about that time, I was looking at Cezanne, and I suddenly got a strange, shuddering impression looking at his canvases, partly the effect when someone pulls the Venetian blind, reverses the Venetian, there's a sudden shift, a flashing that you see in Cezanne's canvases. That's a beautiful description of what he's trying to do, period. He's trying to create a shift in his perception of reality. Partly it was when the canvas opens up into three dimensions and looks like wooden objects, like solid space objects in three dimensions rather than flat. Partly it's the enormous spaces that open up in Cezanne's landscapes. And it's partly that myster mysterious quality around his figure, like of his wife or the card players or the postman, whoever, the local X characters. They look like huge 3D wooden dolls sometimes. It's very uncanny, and it's very mysterious. So, and it's fascinating to look back now when you go home at your Cezannes that you have hanging on your walls. Uh, you'll see them quite differently in this regard. To imagine them as, as um, in a sense, 3D, um, but also that they are uh, putting uh, colors and ideas together that, that don't normally go. And he lands up talking about uh, Mont Saint Victoire, of course, um, the the painting that was you know that was done repeatedly, the image of Mont Saint Victoire uh, by Cezanne. And you can see that, for example, the leaves on the trees or the stones, if you get close to it, it's just it's blotches of color that only make sense when you when you take a distance from it. And it's amazing. And you know, I think he chose Cezanne. I think he could have chosen Pissarro. He could have chosen a whole series of different artists, but it's interesting um, that this is what he sees. And he becomes interested both in that act of juxtaposing, but also in the space in between. The truth of that juxtaposition is somewhere in between. It's not in one side or another. So again, there's this, this idea that we're having today of like, you know, unzipping the universe and, and going in between somewhere. Right, in, in, in interstitial spaces. It's, it's fascinating. So he describes this as you know, literary sim, uh, symbolism and so forth. And he goes on, and then on the, on the top of this, uh, this next page, he says, so I began getting really interested in him as a hermetic type. And I symbolically read into his canvases things that probably weren't there. Like there's a painting of a winding road which turns off, and I saw that as a mystical path. It turns off into a visit, uh, village at the end of the path is hidden. Something he painted, I guess, when he went out painting with Bernard. So he, uh, as you can tell, um, is, is getting quite theoretical here. Uh, he then says, then there was an account of very fantastic conversation it had. It's quoted in Lorraine's book. There's a long, long paragraph where he says, by means of squares, cubes, triangles, I try to reconstitute the impression that I have from nature. The means that I use to reconstitute the impression of solidity that I think feel, see, when I'm looking at a motif like Victoire, is to reduce it to some kind of pictorial language. So I use these squares, cubes, and triangles, but I tried to build them together so interknit, so that no light gets through. 
And I was mystified by that, but it seemed to make sense in terms of the grid of paint strokes that he had on his canvas so that he produced a solid two-dimensional surface that, when you looked into it, maybe from a slight distance with your eyes either unfocused or your lids lowered slightly, you could see a great three-dimensional opening, mysterious, stereoscopic, like going into st uh, stereo, uh, stereopticon. Okay, so he begins to see uh, symbols and truth and so forth. And then, as I said, it's very important that we keep the clown in him. And, you know, you're like, oh, it's very serious, and it's very Columbia, and it's Cezanne, and it's uh, Meyer Shapiro. Then I smoked a lot of marijuana, and I went to the basement of the Museum of Modern Art in New York and looked at his watercolors, and that's where I began really turning on to space in Cezanne and the way it built it up. Okay. So drugs, from this perspective, are a method of taking your rational mind and letting it get out of the way, <laughs> as it were. And I want to argue here that it's not unlike standing on a cliff at Mont Blanc and letting your rational mind get out of the way as you look into eternity, as you look into oblivion, as you look into whatever it is that you look, look or see, uh, see or feel when you're standing on a cliff. So the drugs for uh, Ginsburg are serving the same purpose as nature serves for Wordsworth. In the same way that Wordsworth describes a kid who spins around and around on skates and then is like standing there and can't keep himself right, uh, straight, he sees the world differently. Well, Ginsburg is doing exactly the same thing. It's just that he's doing it with LSD or he's doing it with marijuana. And he's trying to penetrate into the truth of the universe in that way by getting reality uh, to, get, to move out of the way so that he can get closer to magic uh, or truth, uh, be it what it may. So it, it becomes, I, I, what, I'm, what I want to argue here is that the, the, the acting out, the drugs, the sex, the travel, the, sp the, the speed at which they went and so forth, is all part of this desire that is very romantic in my mind um, and, and uh, similar in many ways to what we've been describing. So he says, um, uh, particularly there's one, rock, I guess it's rocks at Garon. You look at them for a while, and after a while they seem like they're rocks. Just the rock parts, you don't know where they are, whether they're on the ground or in the air or on top of a cliff. But then they seem to be floating in space like clouds. And then they seem also to be a bit like they're amorphous, like kneecaps or cockheads or faces without eyes. And again, you see this, oh my god, cockheads. But that's, that's part of what he's part of what he needs to do here is to shock us into understanding. Your, 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 your perception is, is, you're not just lulled into some sort of a belief system. You're constantly being awakened and reawakened by his prose in the same way that you're awakened and reawakened by his poetry. I have a friend who met him at a, a friend of mine who went to a, concert in Pittsburgh, uh, I think, and uh, he saw Ginsburg talking very seriously. I mean, Ginsburg is a serious guy also, talking very seriously to the conductor of the Pittsburgh Orchestra, who was wearing uh, tails and, you know. And this guy walked up to him and said, uh, Alan Ginsburg, you're my poetic hero. I just wanted to, you know, tell you how much I appreciate your work. And Ginsburg goes, <laughs> 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 It's as though you can't you know, you can't hold it up. You know, you got to keep being a clown. And, and if you're caught off guard for a second looking overly serious, you'll find a way to quickly clown it up so that people don't get, you know, don't, don't get too relaxed. And, you know, and again, you know, we, we've talked about Chomsky. Chomsky is the same thing. It's when you start calling somebody, oh, sir, professor, doctor, god, whatever, you lose the ability to, under, to, to interact with that person. Um, he, you know, he must be smart, he's got a PhD. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but one of them is to be in awe of, of somebody on account of a title is exactly the opposite of what he's trying to talk about here. You don't do that. What you try to do is you engage the world on its own terms. Again, you bring it down to earth. So when the, when the carnival king gets naked, or when the fool gets naked, or 
swears or laughs, th that which is missed, that which is putting us into a state of, of false awe, false idolatry, crumbles. And we can actually engage in the world. And that's very much what he's doing here. So, and, and uh, it's, it's fascinating to see this movement from very interesting uh, philosophical notions to, you know, re regular uh, shocks. He then says, uh, in the next paragraph, and then the things were endless to find in Cezanne. And again, he needed the pot to get there. It's not that, he's, he's not taking drugs because he's a bad person. He's taking drugs so we can figure out what Cezanne means, <laughs> as it were. And then the things were endless to find in Cézanne. Finally, I was reading his letters and I discovered this, this, this phrase again. Mes petites sensations. My little sensations. Mes petites sensations. I'm an old man and my passions are not, my senses are not coarsened by passions like some other old men I know. And I worked for years trying to. I guess it was the phrase, re reconstitute the petite sensation that I get from nature. And I could stand on a hill and merely by moving my head half an inch, the compositional landscape was totally changed. Here again, doesn't that sound romantic? And, you know, you, I'm not here, I'm, I'm here, you know, and that's a completely different universe from, from here to here. And if you begin to sensitize yourself like this, this is training, like you really got to work on this, but you can begin to uh, modify your optical perception of the world and in so doing, render the world strange and maybe find uh, other levels of truth. Um, so he says, um, so that was, I felt, the key to Cezanne's hermetic method. Everybody knows his workmanlike, artisan-like, uh, prettified-like painting method that is so great. But the really romanticistic motif behind it is absolutely marvelous. So you realize he's really a saint. And here, too, this is it's not what you expected. You didn't expect him to say, he's really a saint, exclama exclamation point. What does he mean by that? He doesn't mean a saint you know, in the Christian pantheon, necessarily. What he's talking about is that he has access to sanctified knowledge. So, uh, and he happens, it's, it's interesting in this particular sentence, he uses the word romantic. Uh, so we, we have a, a clear connection here. Working on his, on his form of yoga all that time, in obviously saintly circumstances, and of course yoga, you try to imagine Cezanne doing yoga, right? It's, it's, that's funny. It's completely crazy. But you get it. Um, in obviously saintly circumstances of retirement in a small village, leading a relatively non-sociable life, going through the motions of going to church or not, but really containing in his skull these supernatural phenomena and observations. You know, and it's very humble, actually, because he didn't know if he was crazy or not. That's a flash of the physical mir miracle dimensions of existence, trying to reduce that to canvas in two dimensions, then trying to do it in a way that it would look as... Look if the observer looked at it long enough, it would look as much three-dimension as the actual world of optical phenomena when one looks through one's eyes. Actually, he's reconstituted the whole fucking universe in his canvases. It's like a fantastic thing, or at least the appearance of the universe. And that's an amazing challenge. How do you create three dimensions on a, you know, on a uniplanar single-dimension painting? It's an amazing accomplishment. So, you realize that this is all experiments. The Beats were experimenting with language. Cezanne was experimenting with form. And all of them are trying to do the same thing, which is to find truth. And it's looked at from this perspective, the Beats are profoundly philosophical. Ginsburg was a very philosophical guy. Um, so we go from this, you know, Ginsburg makes us feel very familiar with him. You know, he's. He looks like a, uh, uh, one, of your, one of the friends that you didn't bring home to your parents very often. <laughs> um, but you really liked being with him because he was always entertaining. He was always getting into trouble, but he was always entertaining. And part of the reason why he was so entertaining is because of this kind of endless quest that he was always on. And you can see, if you're interested in this, um, there's a short film that was done called Pull My Daisy. Uh, that, that features uh, him and uh, a, a, a text by uh, uh, Kerouac. It's a movie in which he gets high and rolls around the floor and, and, and acts like a clown. 
uh, while Jack Kerouac is reading in the background. And here too, at first it just seems like a lot of silliness. But th there, is, there is this kind of profundity to it that, that relates to the kinds of things that we're talking about. Taking a reality that is quite banal and trying to do something profound with it. So in, in, this, in this regard, I want to look at Sunflower Sutra with you. Because Sunflower Sutra was inspired by a uh, sunflower. And I think it's the ultimate, in some ways, example of what it is that we've been talking about here. So uh, I'll, I'll do my best. I, I'm, I'm, I'll read it instead of having Alan read it, uh, simply because I want to stop. Uh, I walked on the banks of the tin can banana dock and sat down under the huge shade of a southern Pacific locomotive to look at the sunset over the box house hills and cry. Okay, that's one line. Okay, the margin is not wide enough to show up, that's one line. So you realize that he learned a lot from Walt Whitman, right? And the song of myself, my, I'm too big for 10 beats in a, in a line. I exceed the line, so I need more space. And you, as you're reading this from the beginning, I walked on the banks of the tin can banana dock. There is what I'm talking about. Tin can, you know what that is. Banana, you know what that is. And dock, you know what that is. You've never seen them together before. And you have no idea what it is. And yet, there's something in the relationship between tin can and banana, and banana and dock. It's, the space in between is very interesting. And you, you, you can't help but pause there and ask yourself, what does he mean? Why is he doing this? He's doing this for exactly the reasons that we've just looked at. He's trying to smash together reality so as to create new truth. So you suspend that because it's, it's, it's going to happen uh, multiple times. And it sounds cool. And he gives a whole lot of detail, the Southern Pacific locomotive. He's there to look at the sunset and cry. And it's very sad. It's a very sad ending. And, and again, a surprising ending. Jack Kerouac, Jack was, as you know, his best, his, one of his best friends, his lover. Um, I, I say that a lot. <laughs> Almost everybody who you mention as regards Ginsburg, who knew him well, was also his lover. It is men, women, friends, whatever, uh, people he would meet in bathrooms, whatever. It was just like that. And it is what it is. Um, so Jack Kerouac is his buddy. I want to claim uh, brotherhood with Jack Kerouac. Jack Kerouac is Quebecois. Uh, and Jack Kerouac's first language was French. And he didn't speak English until he was five. So he, he's a very interesting character. If you get to know him as a, as a Quebecer, he makes a lot more sense, uh, I, should, I, should, I, I would suggest. Et parler français comme ça, et parler comme un camionneur. If you went to a truck stop in Quebec and you listened to people ordering French fries and stuff, they would sound exactly like Jack Kerouac. And it's fascinating to me because He's a Quebecer, you know, they put, it's, it's a petit peuple, it's a small people. Um, but to think of him as the, as, you know, an, an archetype for American writing is absolutely fascinating. And, and he has such a powerful connection to the English language. But I saw him interviewed uh, years later in French, and uh, I mean, you don't lose languages. So he keeps talking like he was a kid uh, growing up in, in French in Lowell, Massachusetts. It's, it's incredible. And in any event, he and Jack, are walking along together. And then Jack Kerouac sat beside me on a busted, rusty iron pole companion. See the way he does that? So it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's not the connection you would expect. It doesn't follow properly. But it's as, it's as though the commas are the ways in which you sit down. It's an apposition. You know, you've got the kind of... So Jack Kerouac sat beside me on a busty, busted, rusty iron pole comma companion. Comma. So companion makes reference to the first part of the, of the line. We thought the same thoughts of the soul, bleak and blue and sad-eyed, surrounded by the gnarled steel roots of trees of machinery. So this is another point that, I, that I've made a few times, is that these kids, kids, weren't in the Alps. <laughs> and they couldn't afford to be in the Alps, um, obviously. Uh, they're, they're poor. Uh, uh, so they, they, in a sense, nature is around them, but more, it, it's petrified nature. 
in all sorts of cases. And you can imagine, you know what it's like in an, in an industrial wasteland area like New Jersey or uh, you know, where you, you go to certain areas and it's just, it looks like there's been some sort of a catastrophe that's killed everything and all that's left behind is like mangled wires and railway tracks. That's, that's, what, it's, that's what it's like. Gnarled steel roots of trees of machinery. Roots of, roots of trees of machinery. Um, so again, it, it, that juxtaposition makes you realize that the machines are the trees and the trees are the machinery. The oily water on the river mirrored the red sky. Sun sank on top of final Frisco peaks. No fish in that stream. No hermit in those mounts. That's reference to Wordsworth, right? The, where the hermit in the cave sits alone. So Wordsworth can look up at the mount and imagine that the hermit's up there sitting alone. They can't. There's no hermit. Everything around here is dead. We've managed to kill everything, right? No, no, no not there. Um, just ourselves, roomy-eyed and hung over like old bums on the riverbank, tired and wily. Look at the sunflower, he said. There is a dead gray shadow against the sky, big as a man, sitting dry on top of a pile of ancient sawdust. I rushed up and chanted, it was my first sunflower. That is an unbelievable line. It was my first sunflower. It's like you go to Kenya and you see an elephant for the first time. Oh my God, it's, we're going to Chengdu. Marsha's obsessed by this idea. It's my first panda, right? No, this is, this is my first sunflower. He's grown up in a place that's so dead you don't even have sunflowers anymore. This is my first sunflower. This is my first sunflower, he calls out. Memories of Blake. My visions. Harlem and hells in the eastern rivers, bridges, clanking joes, greasy sandwiches, dead baby carriages, black treadless tires, forgotten and unretreaded, the poem of the riverbank, condoms and pots. Steel knives, nothing stainless, only the dank muck and the razor-sharp artifacts passing into the past, and the gray sunflower poised against the sunset, crackly, bleak, and dusty with the smut and smog and smoke of olden locomotives in its eye. So he's looking into it. You know, Blake's was following the sun. This one is just clogged up with the industrial world. It's clogged up not with dust, it's clogged up with whole locomotives. Absolutely unbelievable image. The smoke of old, olden locomotives in its eye. Corolla of bleary spikes pushed down and broken like a battered crown. Seeds fallen out of its face. Soon to be toothless mouth of sunny air. Sun rays obliterated on his hairy head like a dried wire spider web. Leaves stuck out like arms out of the stem. Gestures from the sawdust root. Broke pieces of plaster falling out of the black twigs. A dead fly in its ear. <laughs> Unholy battled old thing you were, my sunflower, oh my soul. I loved you then. So you have this really bleak image of a, a post-industrial, catastrophically destroyed world. And amidst it, you have a vision of despair. But Ginsburg refuses to go there. Instead, he's looking for truth. He's looking for elevation. He's looking for sanctification. He's looking for something spiritual in this dead place. This is itself in some ways an image of poetry uh, tout court. Poetry is a series of black lines on a page, but out of them emerges truth, out of them emerges images, out of them emerges life. If you look carefully into the page, you find truth. But it's just dead matter, it's just a bunch of squiggly lines on a page. So in a sense, this is not unlike the very act of reading in some bizarre way. But these, these squiggly lines do something to your brain, just as this dead sunflower is doing something to his. 
The grime was no man's grime but death and human locomotives. All that dress of dust, that veil of darkened railroad skin, that smog of cheek, that eyelid of black misery, that sooty hand or phallus or protuberance of artificial worse than dirt, industrial, modern, all that civilization spotting your crazy golden crown. And those blear thoughts of death and dusty loveless eyes and ends and withered roots below in the home pile of sand and sawdust, rubber dollar bills, skin of machinery, the guts and innards of the weeping coughing car, the empty lonely tin cans with their rusty tongues alack. What more could I name? the smoked ashes of some cock cigar, the cunts of wheelbarrows and the milky breasts of cars, worn out asses out of chairs and sphincters of dynamos, all these entangled in your mummy roots, and you there standing before me in the sunset, all your glory in your form. <sighs> it's shocking. And it seems as though in making this inventory, he's put every thing in the universe <laughs> into the roots of this poor flower. And the combination of nouns is so surprising, obviously. Uh, it is industrial. It's also the past. It's also waste. It's also filth. But all of it is forcing the sunflower, as it were, to remain standing. It's, it, it's, it's, it's like a vision of the world. It's a vision of the modern world, somehow, you know, with all the... And it, it's, it's interesting to think of, of the Beats, and it's, cer it's certainly interesting to think of somebody like Ginsburg, who, in his initial quests for truth and spirituality, becomes a precursor to that which occurs in the period of the 60s and 70s, and he becomes much more politicized and active in, say, the environmental... Uh, uh, he becomes an active environmentalist. Um, and in a sense, the hippies and the idea of the 60s owes a whole lot to Ginsburg. But his original work is really much more uh, spiritual. Um, and a lot of the beats, uh, in particular Kerouac, um, but also Corso, deny relationship to politics. That they, they're, they're, they're not overtly political. What they are overtly is questing for truth. And as it turns out, if you quest for truth, you, you go to the same places that Shelley went, which is nature. And then lo and behold, you find out that mankind, who lives because of nature, is destroying itself because it's destroying nature. And it makes no sense. So in a sense, it's a logical uh, progression that, that leads him into the environmental movement or into anti-nuclear movement and all sorts of other things he comes to be associated with. But in the first instance, it's this quest for a spirituality and truth that's absolutely fundamental. A perfect beauty of a sunflower. And that's not enough, right? A perfect beauty of a sunflower. That sounds pretty good. No, he's going to try again. A perfect, excellent, lovely sunflower existence. A sweet, natural eye to the new hip moon, woke up alive and excited, grasping in the sunset shadows, sunrise, golden monthly breeze. And I, I love this idea, and I, I, I've mentioned this to you before, but th that he doesn't go back and revise. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> you hear the mind working. I, I find that, I don't know why I'm so obsessed by that idea. We saw, we saw the same thing with D.H. Lawrence. There's something in this desire to, to say or describe that is somehow imperfect, but that remains, and then you try again, that I find absolutely compelling. Um, rather than erase it and, and, and say it more clearly, you keep what was there before. So what the effect of that, it seems to me, is that you watch the brain watching the world. And the brain says, oh my goodness, look at that mountain. It's awesome. It's so beautiful. Oh my goodness, it's actually 
it's covered with trees and they're all smashed. All right. And so if you keep both of those impressions and you remember that first time that you, store, that you stared at Mont Blanc in this class and you went, <gasps> and then you looked a little more closely and you paid more, it's just like when you see somebody beautiful for the first time <gasps> and then you find out what they're like. <laughs> but you can still keep the, you can still keep that first image if you need. Uh, sometimes that's where you want to end. Um, and again, it connects to this memory that we talked about in the very first class. Uh, and I think we, I mentioned this. Um, we've now known each other for years. So when we talk to each other, we, I don't know how many years we've been doing this together, but all of the years that we've been together are all present. We, we, we hold on to all of them at the same time. In the same way that you look at your kids or your neighbor's kids, if you don't have kids, or somebody's kids, or dog, or something, and you think about them at all of their ages. I, I absolutely, I love that. I'm obsessed by that idea. I see my children. I went to a death metal concert this weekend. My son. I, I I recommend a lot of bizarre experiences. This one I'm not convinced that I would recommend, but um, so I see like my three-year-old diving off the stage. He's 26, but I see him at three. <laughs> I think, careful, kid. You know, um, watch out for that music. Um, you, you, you see your children at every single age simultaneously. It's very beautiful. We don't revise. In other words. We don't live entirely in the present. We live in many, many times at the same time. That's a beautiful thought. And it's very hard to capture. And it's one of the things that, that Ginsburg tries to capture, and it's one of the ways in which he connects to the romantic. When, when a romantic poet looks at a mountain, he imagines it in ancient times. It's very interesting, I don't know if you've, if you've read this book, you, I'm sure you've heard of it, called The Sixth Extinction. It's, a, it's an unbelievably, I think, important book. It's about how we've had five extinction, extinctions occur on this planet, and we're manufacturing them the next one. So it's likely that, say, our, our grandkids will, or maybe the, the generation after, will not be able to live on this earth. It's shocking. Um, but one of the things that you read in The Sixth Extinction is that there are people like Darwin, and Buffon and Cuvier, who are able to look at the Earth and imagine them a million years ago. <laughs> That's a really amazing ability. Uh, but you know, they, Darwin gets to the Galapagos and he sails back and whatever else, and he starts thinking, well, I don't know. I mean, it seems to me these continents were probably connected at some point. Who thinks that? That's absolutely, uh, th that we're capable of thinking like that. That is absolutely amazing. You're able to think millions of years ago and today at the same time. It's something that I think the poets are about also. They, 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 they dive into our memory, but they also dive into a more primitive memory, something more deep and profound. So uh, I, I think that all of these things are here. Um, so let, let me just uh, read this again, um, because it's so unbelievably amazing. Um, a perfect beauty of a sunflower, a perfect, excellent, lovely sunflower existence, a sweet natural eye to the new hip moon woke up alive and excited, grasping in the sunset shadow, sunrise, golden monthly breeze. Now the other thing is he can't decide. He figures, what the hell, I'll use all of them. <laughs> is it sunset, or is it shadow, or is it sunrise, or is it golden, or is it monthly? We don't even know what monthly is doing there. What the heck, we'll put them all. And then when you read it, a perfect beauty of a sunflower, a perfect, excellent, lovely sunflower existence. So what you're getting here is a sense of mounting ecstasy. A sweet, natural eye to the new hip moon woke up alive and excited, grasping in the sunset shadow, sunrise, golden monthly breeze. Now you can just hear it's elevating, that you can't help it. And this is, th th this is leading him to this kind of sense of, I mean, it's a sutra, and he's, and he's He's, in a sense, experiencing ecstasy. So we are now high, all of us. Enivrez-vous, says Baudelaire. Get drunk. And he doesn't care whether you do it with drugs, or with sex, or with alcohol, or with poetry. So we're getting drunk over here with poetry, all of us, right now. We're like high as kites. Um, if there's some sort of a you know, they got a police, they got a maquette of a police officer downstairs, you know? Very shocking. Uh, shocking. Uh, 
there's like a cardboard policeman forcing you to, to take a product. I, I think we should put like uh, a Ginsburg poem in his hand. <laughs> All right, you're under arrest. You haven't read enough poetry today. Read this damn poetry. Take some drugs. Go home. God, no. no. It's a corporate ploy. They have a policeman downstairs. In any event, um, a, cor a cardboard policeman. Uh, as you walk into the... Uh, um, in any event... Um, <laughs> What's that? Yeah, jeez, let's just stay high. So, um, so, we're, so be careful when you walk by that policeman, because if he gives you a poetry breathalyzer test, you're going to like burst it. You're going to be way over 0.08, because you're so high on poetry right now. You're just, uh, it's just bubbling out of you, and you're becoming very dangerous. How many flies buzzed round you, innocent of your grime, while you cursed the heavens of the railroad and your flower's soul? Poor dead flower. When did you forget you were a flower? Nobody's ever asked this question in poetry before. This is astonishing. When did you forget you were a flower? When did you look at your skin and decide you were an impotent, dirty old locomotive? The ghost of a locomotive. The specter and shade of a once powerful, mad American locomotive. There's another revision that's completely insane. The question is, when did this flower forget it was a flower? Right? So then the mind says, well, what does it look like? It looks like a locomotive. How come? Because it's got smoke in it. OK, all right, well, that's strange, but we'll, we're, we'll go with it. But look at the way he does it. He keeps adding, like, he keeps thinking about it and revising. When did you look at your skin? So the, the, the sunflower, which of course has a face, which he's looked into. So the face of the sunflower has looked at itself, looked at its own skin, and decided you were an impotent, dirty, old locomotive. When did you do that? Sorry, did I say dirty old locomotive? I meant the ghost of a locomotive. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. The specter and shade of a once powerful, mad American locomotive. So he even evokes the, the locomotive itself. So the sunflower is a conduit into the locomotive itself, great American mad locomotive. You are no locomotive sunflower, you are a sunflower, he says. So the role of the poet is to name the world. The poet is there to remind the flower that it's a flower. What could be more astonishing? That's so beautiful. And we've, we've talked about different roles of poets, right? Poets are there to recognize the sublime, Poets are there to adjudicate the, the world. In Yeats's world, as you know, the poet is there. I will work because I am old, and the flames and the fire grow feeble and cold. The role of the poet is to stay up all night and put new wood on the fire so it doesn't go out. That's the poet's role. So the poet, Yeats, imagines himself as an old woman taking care of children. And if the fire goes out, the children will die. So the poet has to keep waking up at night. And for those of us who have kids, that sounds perfectly natural and correct. That sounds right. So in that case, the poet gives meaning to the world. But here, this world, this post-industrial world, this post-war world, in this world, flowers have forgotten that they're flowers. That's a desperate state of affairs. So although there are many links, I think, to romanticism, there are also ways in which this is a, very, a dis decidedly unromantic world that we're describing here. This is a world in which, you know, Shelley goes to the flower and says, flower, tell me the truth, <laughs> right? Or Blake, ah, sunflower, tell me what the world is about. Well, here, he finds himself in a reverse role. He has to tell the flower that it's a flower. Incredible. That's, uh, th that's, you know, a, a very different world that he's describing. You were, you were never no locomotive sunflower. You were a sunflower. And you, locomotive, you're a locomotive, forget me not. Right? So he's, he's standing in this rail, and he turns around, and he starts yelling at things and telling them what they are. It's just absolutely astonishing. <laughs> so I grabbed up the skeleton thick sunflower and I stuck it at my side like a scepter, 
and deliver my sermon to my soul and Jack's soul too and anyone who will listen. We're not our skin of grime. We're not a dread, bleak, dusty, imageless locomotives. We're golden sunflowers inside, blessed by our own seed and hairy, naked accomplishment, bodies growing into mad, black, formal sunflowers in the sunset, spied on by our own eyes under the shadow of the mad locomotive riverbank sunset frisky hill tin can evening sit down vision <laughs> and that i think is really where the two movements come together this incredibly powerful transportation kind of a metaphysical transportation that we've uh, encountered here as Ginsburg addressing the universe gives it purpose and renders it sublime and renders it truthful. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he worshipped. He loved Whitman. And Whitman was um, you know, gay. And he was powerful. And he was singular. And he was uh, strong. And in many ways, he was America. Ginsburg, uh, Whitman was America. And there's such a message there. This is what, what's forgotten. You know, when we, when we read America last week, America is the Wobblies. America is the IWW. America is the Socialists. America is the Marxists and the Communists and Anarchists and the Freedom Fighters and the, the homosexual poets. That's America. I am America. I'm America, he said. And we, somehow we're being convinced of something different. And it's horrendously sad. That we, and, and if we forget who Whitman was, then we're going to lose America. And, and that's why, again, you know, we looked at, um, and I think it's one of the things that makes this poem so powerful. Um, to, to, to think about what you've just said. I, uh, this reminded me of Whitman. Well, it reminded us also of Voltairine de Clare. It reminded us also of Rimbaud. It reminds us of a lot of people who act, you know, went outside of the bounds of the normal in order to find truth. And they, they did it in all sorts of ways. That, and what was so, what's so great about this country is the ability to do that. Um, and we have to be careful not to lose it. So when, when he says, um, uh, We'll, we'll come back to that. Let's, let's take a look at the top. America, I feel sentimental about the Wobblies. Right? You, know, you, you look at what's going on in Wisconsin right now. And you, you read this line, and you just want to die of sadness. America, I feel sentimentally about the Wobblies. America, I used to be a communist when I was a kid. I'm not sorry. Why would you be? All of the intelligentsia in the Northeast were communists. <laughs> All right. The founders of the neoconservative movement in America were communists. It's obviously, of course they were communists. I mean, they're trying to figure stuff out. I smoke marijuana every chance I get. I sit in my house for days on end and stare at the roses in the closet. When I go to Chinatown, I get drunk and I never get laid. My mind's made up, there's going to be trouble. Should have seen me reading Marx. My psychoanalyst thinks I'm perfectly right. I wouldn't say the Lord's Prayer. I have mystical visions and cosmic vibrations. America, I still haven't told you what you did to Uncle Max after he came over from Russia. I'm addressing you. Are you going to let your emotional life be run by Time magazine? <laughs> you know, it's election season. We ought to be reading this poem out loud. We ought to be chanting it in the streets. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> are you going to let your emotional life be run by... Are you going to let 
you know, reality be described by these people who are describing it to us in like the weirdest ways imaginable? And so, I'm obsessed by Time Magazine. I read it every week. Its cover scares me every time I slink past the corner candy store. I read it in the basement of the Berkeley Public Library. It's always telling me about responsibility. Businessmen are serious. Movie producers are serious. Everybody's serious but me. It occurs to me that I am American. I'm talking to myself again. That is an unbelievable line. And as, as you see him addressing the world, we come back to him addressing the flowers, and addressing himself, and, and reminding, reminding us of authenticity. And it's like, we're, there's somebody trying to beat, us, beat it out of our head and just say, you're a consumer. <laughs> That's what you are. Just buy shit. And you're like, no, I want to stare at sunflowers and find truth. That's much more interesting <laughs> to me. Um, but it, it, it takes that, that will, and it takes that uh, willingness to, to pay attention in the way that he does. Um, and it, then, then you can have visions, uh, visions of eternity and visions of truth. Um, uh, and when he talks, and again, you know, there's a, it, it, on, on top of that, we come, I, I just want to r remind us quickly that it is often the bizarre nature of our own beings. You know, we've, we've saddled with this really strange body <laughs> that does really odd things, right? It's just, and that's okay. It's, that's cool. Rather than like hiding the fact, he celebrates it. Uh, with all of your strange passions and your strange uh, desires and so forth. Um, and uh, what you need to do um, is to be, here comes the, here comes the, stop it. Uh, yeah, this is frightening. But anyway, um, <laughs> you, you, uh, if it restarts, I'm going to blow it up. Um, but the, stop it. Stop it. All right. So, anyhow. It's the world. See, it's trying. It's hearing. <laughs> Holy mackerel, you're starting to get close to the truth here. <laughs> we, better, we better sell you something. Uh, you'll feel better. So um, we get back to what we were saying previously, um, which is that you need to be, the, 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 it, there's this kind of respect for the clown. I won't write my poem until I'm in my right mind. America, when will you be angelic? When will you take off your clothes? When will you look at yourself through the grave? When will you be worthy of your million Trotskyas? America, why are your libraries full of tears? America, when will you send your eggs to India? I'm sick of your insane demands. When can I go into the supermarket and buy what I need with my good looks? That's awesome. That's awesome. And that's something that maybe we should be striving for. To go to the supermarket and buy stuff with our own good looks. America, after all, it's... You and I were perfect, not the next world. Right? Your machinery is too much for me. And it's so interesting to read that line now that we've looked at the locomotive. The locomotive that, you know, that suffocated the, the poor sunflower. Uh, it's too much for me. You just made me want to be a saint. And I think now, as, the, as, as we think back upon this course together, we understand what we mean by wanting to be a saint. It's this connection, it's this profound connection to the eternity that we see in the face of the sunflower or in the top of the mountain or in the memory of being with our sister uh, at Tintern Abbey. Somehow this quest, this revolutionary quest of these young people, is, is, it, it, it continues to resonate. I think it re resonates really strongly. So that's why I wanted to put them together, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, he, you know, he is a Jewish kid. His father was a poet, grew up in New York, and recognized his homosexuality, I think, very early on. He had girlfriends uh, and slept with them. And he slept with gr uh, women uh, after having come out, as it were. Um, I think that both being the, the son of a poet uh, being himself a poet, and you know, he was at Columbia and, and exploring literary issues made him perhaps uh, feel um, marginal, marginalized, 
uh, maybe able to see the world somewhat differently. And it couldn't have been easy to be in America in the 1940s and 50s homosexual. It's still not easy. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know. I mean, he, he was very overt about it. I mean, he, he and his multiple lovers, but one in particular, they used to read their poetry naked. <laughs> uh, they did it at Yale. It was very fun. They actually had sex at Yale on the stage. Um, it, so it's again, it's, it's marginal, but it's it's provocation. It's 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 truth. It's the truth of our bodies, and and rather than be embarrassed ab about any of it, he he learns to celebrate. He was also not particularly gorgeous, I, I must say, but he somehow looks gorgeous uh, in his in his strength and his his word. I I also think about the beats. You know, th the reason why. The beats, the reason why we're reading America or Howell is because of a trial. He, he, was, he was on trial with Farron and Getty for a sens uh, for, for, um, uh, on a censorship charge. It's likely that had that not occurred, we would not even know about this stuff. Which doesn't make me think that there was a, a potentially lost genius. What it makes me think is that there were probably thousands of kids in that same year who were feeling as thousands of millions of kids feel now, or as we feel, um, askance, outcast, uh, whatever. And we're writing about it. And some of the kids, I mean, I, I see my own students write stuff. I, I think this could be Ginsburg. It's so good. You know, one of the things about reading beat poetry is it makes you feel like writing. And a lot of what they write is so filled with, with poetic genius. They'll probably never get known. Um, but there are, there are millions of people out there who are writing uh, profound things. And, and so the, he becomes the, the known and becomes the champion of, of poetic knowledge and so forth. It just turned out that he was really, really good, not only at poetry, but also explaining what he meant. I'm not so convinced that Corso was so good at, at, at it in that regard. I think Corso's poetry is wonderful, but he was pretty lousy at explaining what he was up to. So um, Ginsburg got, it's, it's almost like he got lucky that he got charged. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, it's, what is it, for me, I'm, I'm a foreigner. Uh, what effect has that had on me? Uh, living in this country, I, I, I love it and I embrace it, but I also see it from the outside. And I guess seeing anything from the outside is salubrious. We're about to spend the summer in China. Uh, anything like that is bound to be helpful. Um, so... Uh, I don't know, I guess whether you're homosexual or whether you're bisexual or whether you're drug addicted or whether you're uh, ADD or whatever, you see the world differently. And, and, the w and we all do for some complex combination of reasons. Um, so I don't know, it's a, it's a tough one. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm. Mm. Right. It's, it's beautiful. Um, and I, I think it goes to, to a, multiple things. One of them is that he makes us aware of that. But the other thing is that he makes us realize that we don't need to be in that fabulous field of sunflowers to seek out the sublime. That there's something incredibly empowering about the beats. That you can be, you can possess 
you know, if, if you look at what you own, you own almost nothing, but if you have your imagination, then there's incredible things that you can do. And uh, th I think the, the romantics in many ways taught us similar things, but it's, yeah, it's, it's fascinating, yeah. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Well, I, it, he's so profound and he's so beautiful, and all of his work is is profound and beautiful. And he is, you know, I keep saying this, but if if, if our kids, if you just said, okay, kid, you're five, you got Ginsburg, you Byron, you, <laughs> um, uh, just Moby Dick. That's all you get. That's your whole education. They would learn a million times more than they're learning in high school, I think. Um, but yeah, Ginsburg is, is profound and, and theoretical and philosophical and deep and beautiful. And, and as you get to be obsessed by him and you w read his works, his Kaddish, his, his um, monuments to his mother and, and his father who died, his memories of, of his mother uh, and her mental illness, his relationship with Jack, his interest in French, uh, French poetry of the modern era, it's unbelievably profound. Um, and yeah, I, I, he, he's a real gateway into, into a, so you can begin with him and then move outward to all of his friends. And, and it's, it's an astonishing, uh, it's, it's an astonishing pleasure, uh, it really is. I had this horrible email yesterday from the BBC World Service and they said, uh, we'd like to interview you uh, for the obituary of Noam Chomsky. And I, I almost had a heart attack. It's like this, this message I've been fearing for decades. Um, and it turns out that for really famous people, they write their obituaries in advance. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, they're interviewing me next week for something that hasn't happened yet, uh, just in case, I guess. Um, but for he, people like Ginsburg and Chomsky, who I think of as two unbelievably great Americans. I mean, Americans just, uh, you know, in the, in the way that Wright or Emerson or, you know, there are Americans who, who embody so much. And if you just spend a lot of time getting to know these, these single people, it, the, the networks to which they connect you is, is so amazing. And it makes you truly, you know, th this, this course in some ways is about celebrating our lives and celebrating everything that's good. But it's also about nostalgia uh, for that which we're losing, and that's what we've lost. To I'm sorry, I, you know, I, I believe it or not, I have weird opinions, but to to really, uh, you know, when we talk about having a book for the state, like I, I have a few suggestions, you know, I, <laughs> I, it's it, it's hard, it's it's hard, you know, and we have to think of what we're losing when we make decisions like this. Um, and that's okay. I mean, we need to have discussions and debates. That's what America's about. We gotta keep, we gotta hold on to that. And yeah, Ginsburg did a lot of bad things. <laughs> uh, did a lot of bad things. Um, and he, you know, he was arrested multiple times and did a lot of terrible drugs and all sorts of other stuff. But he he, he is American, uh, and that's it's, it's amazing. It's something. That, and Byron also did a lot of bad things, <laughs> and he's you know he's a hero. So it it kind of it it kind of um, oozes out here you know, uh, in this course. Yeah. yeah. He had, you know, he had friends, he had musical friends. Uh, Kerouac in particular was obsessed by jazz. Uh, and, and Kerouac was one of the, in a sense, pioneers of an understanding of what it meant to be in a, in a jazz club in New York City, surrounded w without any white people around, and trying to figure out the cadences and so forth. I think Ginsburg also had connections to African American music of all sorts, but I think that he found in Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan um, just the the wordsmiths uh, that he adored, um, and he would stay with uh, when he would go to Montreal. He would stay with Cohen, and he uh, would would stay from what I understand uh, would stay with Dylan. You can imagine their overlaps, uh, and they, there too. I mean, you take Dylan; it's, it's America in so many different ways, like Willie Nelson. America, 
you know, it's just, so the, the relationship I think is, is a, a wordsmith one. I don't know how profound it was. I don't know that it was any more deep than it was with Leonard Cohen. I don't know if he saw him that often. I have photos of the two of them together in my office. But I, you know, he doesn't talk a whole lot about the mutual influence and so forth in his letters and such. So, um, but you know, Ginsburg, my, my next book I've decided is, is about uh, Ginsburg and Corso and Burroughs went to Paris for three years. And there they lived in a complete flea bag hotel and uh, did a lot of their greatest stuff from the outside. You know, they're living in Paris without speaking the language well. Um, and their connection, I think, to um, French uh, writings is not very well understood, and that's what I want to write about. Um, and, uh, and them living in this, in this dump, like unimaginable dump, uh, the way that they lived during the, the uprisings in Algeria and so forth. It's a really fascinating story. And there you get to see, oh, okay, he had all these other connections too. And somebody could write a book about him in India and find other connections. So I think Dylan is one of many. Um, important, but many. Any other? Oh, we got, oh, we've been given an extension. It's because we've been so good. We've been good. No, it's actually because we've acted out. We've been so bad. Well, thank you for everything. I'm really grateful to you all. Uh, it's been really fun. And um, I hope to see you again soon.